Hello everyone, a warm greetings. Thank you one and all for joining this particular webinar that was winning strategies for PCID 4.0 compliance. The main focus of PCIDS's 4.0 compliance of this webinar is to understand the various strategies that the organizations should follow in transition from 3 to 1 of PCIDS's to 4.0. So, introducing myself, my name is Chaitra. I'm an authorized PCI QSA and QPA with an expertise of 10 years and have been a master trainer of CPSI and have trained around 20 plus trainings across the world. So coming back to CISA, CISA is a global forensic driven cybersecurity organization providing the robust preventive, detective, corrective cybersecurity solutions. CISA was founded in the year 2006 and it is one of the first USA companies in Asian market. In fact, we do have the offices across the world and one such thing started back in 2008 in Middle East, followed by America and Europe. So we do have 1000 plus active engagements every year and we do have a strong foothold across 40 plus countries and with 2000 plus global customers. As a crown to organization, we are also a leading PCI forensic investigators as well. And we have been recognized by various organizations, including PCI, SSC, Crest, and various payment brands. So as we kick start this particular webinar, some things that we need to follow as this particular session would be 40 minutes, inclusive of question and answers for the last five minutes. All the attendees will be on listen only mode. Please do raise your questions if there are any in a dedicated Q&A section. So we are very happy to have a panelist from various continents working in different domains. So here comes our first speaker, that is Mr. Jeremy King, who is a regional VP of PCI SSC, who comes with a rich experience working in policy and procedures and standard, uh, you know, committees of various family brands. So welcome to the session, Jeremy. Thank you. So the second panel member is Mr. Dawood, who is an AGM of Information Security, Privacy and Fraud, KIB. So he comes with a rich experience so of, uh, you know, dedicated uh, experience and in information technology and security domain, along with from a research background. So we are happy to have you in this particular webinar, uh, Dawood. Welcome on board. Thank you, dear. So finally, we have our third speaker, that is Mr. Sam Butler, who works as a CISO for one of the most recognized authentic organizations with a rich experience of 20 years of uh, 20 years in a financial sector we are happy to have him on this particular webinar who will help us in understanding the various strategies that he has followed in his experience to guide us on the strategic transition of pcids 3 to 1 to 4.0 uh, welcome sam thank you very much so diving into the panel discussion so the the themes of this particular webinar includes the timelines of implementing the PCIDSS 4.0 and how do we get an update and, you know, updated with respect to various PCIDSS related controls. And we'll also be focusing on the major differences which has come up along with PCIDSS 4.0. For example, define and customize approach, how targeted risk analysis must be focused by the organizations and what are the factors where TRE needs to be implemented as well as focusing on application security, API security, and payment page integrity security as well. And one of the more uh, challenging one being the application and service level account related management. And what is the right version to choose as of today from the PCIDSS validation, as well as the essential strategies from your experience in migrating to PCIDSS 4.0. So going ahead, the first one is, uh, Jeremy, this is for you. Like, you know, as we are moving ahead with 4.0, what do you think are the timelines that organizations should consider? So what is the trend of PCIDSS validation 4.0? And how do organizations stay relevant and updated with respect to the changes that are happening, the services that you are providing with respect to PCIDSS standard? 
No, thank you very much, Chaitra. So as you can see on the uh, screen now, this is the timeline for the implementation of PCI DSS version four. As you can see, we officially released the standard back in 2022, but we are now approaching the time very closely when version 321 is going to retire. So really we're fast approaching that point. And if you are uh, in the middle of, or at the start of doing an evaluation, you can complete that against 321, but you really should be getting yourself ready for the migration to version four. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the key things that the council has always done when introducing new standards is, we always like to give everybody plenty of time to get used to the new requirements, to get used to the changes, and also to be able to prepare their organization for this. And this is absolutely true with PCI DSS. You can see we released it back in 2022 to give a lot of uh, time for people to do the check-in, do the planning, do the gap analysis. But on top of that, even when we release version four, we're still going to give everybody an extra year before the majority of new requirements become effective. When you're going through and reading through the uh, PCI DSS version four, for some of the new requirements, for a lot of the new requirements, you will see this statement written at the bottom in red. This is a new requirement. It's the best practice until the 31st of March. So you can migrate to version four without having to be ready to do these new requirements. You can start doing the planning and the checking, the gap analysis for these. Next slide, please. Now, the other thing is the council provides an awful lot of information, and we put a lot of those in new frequently asked questions. And these are available on our website. There is a lot of information on our website. You can find the frequently asked questions by either going on our website and looking at the top right-hand corner, you'll see FAQs where the orange arrow is, or you can go into the resources tab, and again, you'll see the FAQs. Once you're in there, you can find a lot of information about PCI DSS version four. So I would recommend that people who are moving and migrating to DSS four do go and have a look at that, because that will save you a lot of time as we've answered many of the common questions that we receive. Next slide, please. So again, as well as updating the standard, we've been making changes to all of the supporting documentation, and that includes the self-assessment questionnaires. All of those have been updated, and they also include the new requirements. And again, those new requirements will state in red whether they are going to be not, uh, sorry, whether they're going to be a best practice until the 31st of March 2025. We've also updated our self-assessment questionnaire guidelines, and this is really useful if you need to try and check to see which of the SAQs is appropriate for you. Next slide, please. As I've said, we've got a lot of information available on our website, so do visit it, do have a look around the resources. One of the things that's really, really popular amongst organizations globally is the quick reference guide. This can be downloaded from the website. It's an easy to read, easy to follow guide, really to help you in your, in your transition through PCI DSS version four. And there is also some good blogs and some podcasts from council staff explaining some of these changes. So again, a, a real mine of information available for you. Next slide, please. So really, you know, we're talking about it now. We're near, you know, we're middle of January. The start, the end of March is fast approaching. The time to act is now. Please don't wait. Do start working with your QSA because the sooner you start working with your QSA, the earlier you can start planning how you're going to do that migration and how you can ensure that you're going to continue to meet the PCI DSS and to ensure the strong security protection of your cardholder data. Back to you, Chaitra. Thank you so much for your insights, uh, Jeremy. So the details that you have given actually makes all the participants to be aware of the PCI DSS standard and how do they can be updated with various feedbacks or reference documents that is being provided by PCISC. So just to reiterate, PCI DSS document, documents are available on the website and anyone can refer them. And just to make sure that connect with your QSC, plan your assessments ahead so that there would not be a challenge and easily the transition to a next version can happen. So coming back 
to this, we have seen multiple organizations who are implementing the PCIDSS 4.0 requirements or getting validated on 4.0. So one such common questions that we ideally come across is the fine approach and the customized approach. How organizations can come up with the customized approach? So that would uh, for you this, like how do you think that organizations can come up with customized approach? Have you seen any time that, you know, giving this flexibility from PCI DSS standard has made you know, organizations easy to come and implement and meet the intent of the objective? Excellent question, uh, Chetra. We we believe that the new PCI DSS has introduced a new profound security countermeasures that should help organizations secure their environments. We at KIB, we are very fond of the customized approach. This is mainly because it has enabled us to comply with PCI DSS requirements, especially when adopting you know, innovative technology. Uh, a simple example, like the advanced machine learning um, for our fraud management solution that we felt did not fit neatly into the defined uh, approach requirements. Um, systems with machine learning capabilities, they tend to require processing uh, and storing large amount of um, transaction data. Uh, such as a data set that includes uh, cardholder data in a way that we believe cannot be served using the defined approach. Now, as a bank, we have a robust uh, and a comprehensive risk assessment process in place that helps us understand and manage the risks uh, associated with the cardholder data where we are able to comply with the PCI DSS um, customized approach. Therefore, we're currently at this stage, uh, as we're speaking, we're working closely with our um, QSA to make sure it is acceptable and that the necessary uh, testing procedures are appropriate to the specific uh, implementation. Therefore, my advice is to engage with the QSC at the earliest possible as they will be able to help out uh, in the customized uh, approach process. Back to your question. Yes. yes, great one, uh, Dawood. Uh, what you mentioned is my, one of the most important thing, especially when it comes to a customized approach, QAC has to come up the validation methodology to validate the customized implementation. Not only this, as an organization who has implemented the customized approach or planning to implement the customized approach, right, should have a proper risk management practices in place, right? So, and also the documentation of the customized approach, ensuring that all the details are intact is one of the most important thing. And QSA's involvement in validating this particular implementation is one of the critical points of this customized approach. And at the end of the day, you have to meet the intent or objective of the control or a requirement, even if you're implementing either defined approach or a customized approach. So Sam, considering this particular customized approach coming into picture, what are the various other strategies that the organizations can take it up, especially when they are from e-commerce related domains or basically when they work on online payment related security aspects? Sure. I think uh, one of the key considerations is to make sure that when using the customized approach, not to do it mid-audit, to make sure that customized approach controls are um, prepared and uh, evaluated, especially risk assessed prior to the assessment, to make sure that it's um, not something like dealing with a missed control um, and obviously not a, as a compensation for a lack of control. So key advice for me is really do them up front, make sure they're well understood and well assessed in terms of the targeted risk assessment. Great. Thank you so much for your valuable input, Sam. So the next one is related with the targeted risk analysis, as Sam mentioned, right? So when we are implementing this customized approach or one of the new methodology that has come into 4.0 practices is targeted risk analysis. So Jeremy, over to you, why this trend of targeted risk analysis has come into picture? So we had a risk assessment also in the previous versions of PCI DSS, right? So what is this particular targeted risk analysis has come up? What are the things that organizations should ideally consider when they are implementing TRA? No, thank you very much. Yes, one of the things that um, both Sam and Dawood have said there is, is the introduction of the new customized approach. And, and the customized approach is really looking at um, enabling an organization to show that they meet the intent of a requirement if they can't specifically meet it against the defined approach. And so to try and show that they do meet that intent, then we wanted to have a real targeted risk analysis, which is focused around that particular requirement, 
to enable the organization to actually convince the or to show to the QSA that, yes, we are taking this seriously and, yes, we are meeting the intent. So really, when, a, when an organization wishes to utilize a customized approach, then this enables the organization to confirm that the approach is going to meet that level of security as described and that they are going to provide all of that information that allows the QSA to confirm that this has been undertaken. It also has a second use. In the requirements, there are also some requirements that allow for flexibility. And within that flexibility, the TRA, the Targeted Risk Analysis, is used to, to, to help really define how frequently these checks and tests must be carried out. So again, they provide guidance and support to the QSA to enable them to validate that, yes, you know, the security measures are being taken as we would expect. So it's a really powerful tool, and it is really one that organizations should be using within PCI DSS version 4. Thank you so much for your insights, Jeremy. So this being a new one, and this particular TRE is applicable wherever we are going with the customized approach and the requirements which comes up with flexibility uh, of or periodicity, providing the organizations the flexibility to perform certain activities. So this particular one is in fact meeting the one of the major goals of PCI DSS 4.0 that is like, you know, flexibility to the organization, empowering the organizations to meet the intent of the control. So considering that targeted risk analysis, uh, so that would, what do you see this particular one? How organization can perform the TRA considering that there are huge scopes in the organization, considering that multiple requirements coming into picture? Yes, Chatra, that's also another good question. Um, so first of all, we need to, before initiating the TRA, we need to properly identify the scope of the PCI. So what we did uh, in KIB is that we conducted a comprehensive workshop to identify the specific risks. The workshop consisted from key stakeholders like um, the business, the IT, and the information security team, which has helped us uh, to pinpoint the unique risks. We then implemented uh, appropriate controls to mitigate those identified risks uh, that either offered um, equivalent or even a better protection. And then we have opted for um, various technologies and processes um, that helped us to regularly uh, monitor and review the effectiveness of the controls to ensure that the controls uh, do provide a continuous protection uh, based on those identified uh, risks. What usually auditors are expecting are basically two things, right? So, of course, the, the first point is having a proper um, documentation of the entire TRA process um, that provides a clear trail of uh, how the risks were identified, um, assessed, and mitigated. And the second point, as Jeremy uh, clearly mentioned, is that the entity's justification, right, of how frequently the activity must be performed and how the frequency of the, I mean, how this frequently addresses the entity's risks. Back to you, Chatra. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting two important things, Davo. The first one is identification of the scope, right? Identifying the scope is the one of the major critical point of PCIDSS validation. So whether we are running the data discovery solutions to identify or how are we managing the scope, and the next one is training the stakeholders with the right set of knowledge, what they are required to implement, and then performing the risk assessment and ensuring it is documented and the risks, whatever it is identified, are remediated and ensured that the same things are in place throughout the validation cycle is the major one. So thank you so much for your insights. So coming back to you, Sam. So again, from the TRA perspective, so what are the strategies that organizations can follow on this particular aspect? You know, I think the key uh, advantages of the uh, target risk assessment is to put everything into uh, context of reality in terms of things being less theoretical, being able to prove that um, especially the, the controls you're putting in place are validated in a sense of the real world threats that might apply to them. And especially in terms of validating how effective they are. Um, especially for the QSAs, but also for anyone who wants to see uh, room for improvement or other areas that need to be en enhanced. I think it gives a good platform for um, putting practicality and real world aspect to the controls that PCI is looking for you to meet. Thank you so much for, for pro providing your valuable insights, Sam. So as we discussed, TRA is one of the most critical one and performing the risk assessment on these specific 
uh, PCRDS scope and identifying the risk and remediating them on time is one of the major ones. And getting that particular, you know, remediated observations or remediated implementations by the external QSA will help your organization to achieve the security posture along with the PCRDSS validation. So going ahead for the next one is application security. So as we all know that, you know, PCRDSS 4.0 has come up with lots of new changes. One such change is having the automated monitoring solutions for all external facing web applications. And there are also so many other new controls which are related with API security, maintaining the bespoke and custom software inventory, and also implementing payment page integrity checks for all payment pages or e-commerce platforms. So coming back to you, Jeremy, where is this trend coming from? What do you think that, you know, maintaining this application level security is implement, you know, requirement is very important to the organizations? Is it just for external phasing or do you consider all applications in the organization in the scope to be considered under this particular security requirement? No, that, thank you very much, Chetra. That's a really good question. Um, the world is moving to software. The world is moving to APIs. So it is something that we have to look at and have to address because when the world moves somewhere, unfortunately, so do the criminals. So from the council's perspective, all software that stores, processes, or transmits accounts data, well, that could impact the security of account data is in scope for PCI DSS. And the entity's assessment should include verification that this software is properly configured and securely implemented to support applicable PCI DSS requirements. And that's one of the key things is this configuration, the implementation of it, and, and really, you know, the controls, the access of it. And we're seeing a lot of attacks on business logic, including attempts to abuse or bypass application features and functionalities through the manipulation of APIs, the communication protocols, the channels, et cetera, et cetera. So really the criminals are trying to are seeing this as a way in. And so these, these vulnerabilities, especially in third party components, including the libraries, the APIs, which are embedded into the entity software, means that this whole process is, is open to attack and is really giving the criminals new channels of uh, ingress into an organization to be able to steal that cardholder data. So knowing which third party components are used in an entity software, monitoring the availability and the security patches to address those known vulnerabilities are critical. And certainly patching is really critical. You cannot not implement security patches because the longer that time passes between the patch becoming released and becoming implemented allows more time for the criminals to uh, to really be able to gain access to your system. So for all of these reasons, for, for all these different entities that now have some way of impacting your security, we've had to improve the level of security around applications and API. Thank you so much for your valuable inputs, Jeremy. So adding to the same point, Performing the patching or identification of the vulnerabilities is one of the most important. And also PCRDSS 4.0 specifically focuses that we have to perform the credential-based vulnerability scans as well. And coming back to third-party-based applications or the frameworks or the tools that we would be using from the application perspective or from the infrastructure perspective is very important. And identifying their vulnerabilities and remediating them will also help the organizations to achieve the better security posture. So coming back to you, uh, Mr. Dawood, uh, this is related with, again, API security. So what do you see or how two organizations can achieve the API and application security? And how important are these security, I mean, application level security is important to an organization? Okay, so um, what we have learned based on the lessons learned and breach cases globally is that over and over again, um, UIs or let's say the application itself um, consumes APIs, right? And those APIs are um, basically weak. And um, and we've seen that majority of the security enforcements are at the UI level. So you'll find that the API are, API are either um, over permissioned in a, uh, in a sense that it will return more data than they should, or they have um, authorization flow logic. So in, in, in KIB, what we have done is that we have adopted like a, uh, Agile methodology, we've shifted security to left as a strategy and adopted the OWASP API top 10. 
We have also um, promoted the end users' um, awareness, uh, making them understand what are the secure coding practices and how PCI DSS expects us to handle card cardholder information. There are also good um, solutions out there um, that provide uh, a continuous uh, uh, assessment like the breach attack simulation that basically evaluates the security controls in place against emerging attacks uh, uh, on, a re on a regular basis. Back to you, Chetra. Yes, thank you so much for your inputs and in, uh, Dawood. So as you mentioned, right, the first thing is agile methodology and OSAP related one coming into a picture. So implementing these kind of controls in the applications would ideally make the application more secure. And the second one is related with the uh, forensic learnings or forensic investigations, internal investigations that you can probably come up with will also help you to identify if there is any loophole in the organizations at the application level as well. And coming back to you, Sam, so where do you think that payment page integrity check is coming into picture, especially when web pages with respect to payment information or payment page related web applications, right? So why do you, or how do you think that payment page integrity checks can be implemented in the organization? Well, I think the key thing is um, good governance, good hygiene, um, good understanding of how those uh, pages are implemented and designed, uh, fully understanding um, the capabilities of those pages and their intent. But to add to that, you know, and obviously there are a lot of tooling and ways to automate um, the life cycle of these uh, management of these pages. But the key to me is really testing and remediation on a very um, frequent and urgent basis in terms of anything that's identified uh, needs to be addressed quickly and within within reasonable time frame. So um, for me, the key of all of this, while there always be risks and uh, threats identified um, on payment pages, the key is identifying them and remediating them in the most urgent way possible. Great. Thank you for your valuable feedback, Asan. So as overall panel members emphasized on this application security, first thing is ensure that this particular tools, the solutions that are used in the application are always intact. Vulnerabilities are identified, remediated within a limited time rather than keeping it for a longer, I will longer time and ensuring that, you know, proper patching of the, uh, you know, infrastructure as well as applications are done and ensure that vulnerability scans are also carried out and perform the internal forensic investigations as and when required to be clear on the security posture of the organization. Not only this, you can also ensure that you have a 24 bar 7 managed uh, detection and resolution teams, MDR teams working around so that even if there is any critical alerts that are coming into a picture are also highlighted to the relevant stakeholders at the earliest possible time and ensuring that if alerts are raised, they are remediated as well. So considering this, we can go ahead with the next one is related with management of application and system and service level accounts. We all know that almost all the compliance standards will speak about user related accounts. So how do we ensure that, you know, basically authentication of the user accounts or the management of user accounts, review of user accounts is a pretty common one. But now with respect to PCF DSS 4.0, one more major challenge that we ideally see is the management of application level and service level accounts. So Jeremy, over to you on this particular one. How do you think or from where this particular trend of ensuring or management of application and service level accounts has come into picture and how critical is it for the organizations working in the payment domain? No, absolutely. Yeah. And I think when you look back into the history of, of PCI DSS, when we first set it up, a lot of the requirements were, were focused around keeping the criminals out of an organization. Um, but we realized that you know, as time went on, criminals were always finding a way in through various different methods. And so we needed to start improving the permissions and the controls. And initially that was focused at the administrators. We, we used to find that uh, for organizations, they would have a common administrator account with a common password. So if the, if the criminals could find that, then they could literally go anywhere within an organization. So we set off having unique identification, unique things for the administrators. We then realized that 
uh, we also needed to improve controls. So initially for, again, remote access, we started putting in multi-factor authentication. We felt that one form, just a password, wasn't strong enough. So we introduced the need for multi-factor authentication. Uh, and again, that to, to challenge the types of attack. Now we're seeing that the criminals are very good at phishing. They're very good at trying to obtain credentials of, of workers. And so we have to expand the, the, the multi-factor authentication across all users and across all access to systems and services. So that really we're trying to make it as difficult as possible for the criminals to be able to move around even if they get into an organization. Now, we recognize also that some organizations still need to use passwords. And one of the things, again, when you look at actually, it's quite a few years since we we did a big update from version three to version four. And in that time, technology and, and password uh, use has changed significantly. So we had to increase significantly the number of, of characters that were required. So if you still do have to use a password, remember PCI is a base level. So if you want to go above what PCI sets, brilliant. If you don't want to use passwords, that's fine. Just use the multi-factor authentication. If you are using passwords, then you know three word phrases are easier to remember. They're longer, the longer the password, the better. But really it's, it's trying to prevent the criminals from being able to find an easy way into an organization. And then when they are in, trying to prevent them from being able to get around and steal that data. Yes, thank you so much for giving your valuable inputs, Jeremy. As you mentioned, uh, you know, few more changes that we ideally seen in 4.0 is extending the multi-factor authentication to all the users in CDE, as well as the phishing related, you know, automatic solutions that we need to have, as well as the awareness that needs to be provided among the stakeholders who are in PCI DSS scope. This all will help the organizations to ensure that this organization security posture is good enough so that even if the hacker comes into the organization has relevant steps so that he can't reach the actual payment card information in the organization, right? And considering this, uh, now uh, being an implementer yourself, right? So how easy it is for the organizations to change the application and service level accounts? What are the critical steps that as an implementer you need to consider, You strategies that you can come up so that the intent and the objective of this particular requirement is met? Sure. Um, before I answer that, I mean, we, we believe that the access management issue is that the accounts are over permission, right? So this is the biggest challenge. And, and once you have an, an accessive uh, uh, an account, that basically means you are able to retrie retrieve accessive data and attackers love this. So, uh, and we've noted that majority of the accounts do not follow the least privilege uh, principles. And what makes it even worse is that there is no proper inventory. So we believe that uh, adopting uh, privilege access management, endpoint access management solution, or uh, having a proper identity access management in place is, is important. Um, also adopting key management solution uh, could also render effective and uh, secure the keys that are generated from, from you know, the systems within, within the environment. Um, shifting is is not that easy, I understand, um, but you need to assess the complexity. You need to have um, a firm action plan in place that would um, help you achieve the, uh, achieve the intended uh, objective. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Dawood. As you mentioned, right, uh, first thing is inventory of these accounts is a biggest challenge. Many of our organizations may not even know these kind of inventories of these accounts. The second thing is changing the password may not be a feasible one. At that time, we can proceed with these stringent complex passwords in these cases as well. So, right. Thank you so much for those insights. So coming back to you, Sam. So what are the other strategies that you can provide us, the participants, so that they can go and ensure that this particular control is met in an easiest way? and in a good way. Sure thing. <clears throat> I think the, the key thing here is it's a very complex um, problem to solve, especially if you've got a lot of legacy, a lot of uh, accounts that aren't well managed in terms of uh, what their intent and you know real access requirements are. For me, it's always about understanding what's the organizational perspective before starting on a technical uh, change, understanding what are the real um, role-based access requirements, start from a, um, 
almost like a use case perspective rather than digging straight into the tooling and the you know the technology that will help uh, support this um, this control area and really focus on uh, is there a redesign required is there a, re a new understanding of access as a concept in the organization and um, don't underestimate the amount of effort it could take to re redesign rebuild and reorganize things that are basically more in line with what industry best practices are. And, and as Jeremy mentioned, PCI is aligning closer to what we see in the real world out there. And uh, by doing this, um, it reduces the risks significantly. Yes, fantastic answer, Sam. So overall, just to reiterate, like how do we manage these kind of application and service level accounts as first as identification of the service level and application level accounts, prioritizing which one is critical to an organization performing the risk assessment and then updating the uh, complexity of these kind of accounts. Not only this, monitoring these accounts on a regular basis, documenting the same and creating an awareness among the stakeholders is where all this particular requirement can be easily met. And I think this is one of the wonderful strategy that the organizations can consider into. So, Considering the next one, I think uh, this is the right question to Jeremy. Like, you know, Jeremy, you might have come across this question like thousands of times. So what is the right version for an organization if they want to choose it now, 3 to 1 or 4.0? I have seen in my experience, like, you know, during the transitions, organizations have taken more than a year as well. So considering this particular fact and considering the complexity of the technologies and the threat landscape as well, so what is the right option for the organizations to choose now from a PCI DSS, a three to one getting expired in next two months? No, you're, you're right. This is one of the most common questions we're receiving. So given that we are in middle of January, I think you have to look at your organization along the lines of how long will it take us to undertake our annual assessment? And if you consider that actually through a normal assessment will easily get that completed before the end of March, then you can undertake 321. It is still recognised, valid and supported, and that can be your annual assessment. If you think that you're going to be close, you know, or actually it takes a couple of months, so we might get to the near the end of, of March, I would recommend you talk to your acquirer and work with your QSA to see if actually that's going to be acceptable to do that under 321. But I would also say, given that we've pushed out the new requirements, the real, there aren't, you know, the, the move to version four isn't that big. So if you have done your um, gap analysis, if you are ready, if you're looking at version four thinking, let's do this, then you can do it now. I've seen a lot of organizations around the world who have successfully implemented and had validated their version four assessment. So it is one of time. It is that if you can get it completed and you're comfortable with doing that this year, then go for it. If you're equally comfortable, actually want to show we do take, you know, we really want to get this new version in place because we think it's going to be good for our organization. And by the way, it is going to be good for your organization. Then migrate to version four. Great. Great answer, Jeremy. So at this point of time, it is always recommended to go with 4.0, considering that the detailed gap analysis can be done. Organizations can plan if there is any new technical requirements coming into picture in future as well. So considering the tight deadline that we have for 3 to 1, it is recommended to go with 4.0. However, if the still organization is more comfortable with 3 to 1, they can proceed with 3 to 1, but it is honored before 31st March 2024. So considering this, moving ahead with the next one is, so what are the two essential strategies that you see in the seamless transition from PCI DSS 3 to 1 to 4.0? So that would, can you provide your two essential strategies that the other stakeholders can also implement in their organizations? I think um, before um, reviewing any standard, like like similar to any standard release, right? The the first thing we should look at is the summary of changes document. I think this is a, a good starting point. It it helps us to it gives us an insight uh, into the level of changes made uh, uh, by PCI DSS, and I think they have done a great job highlighting those changes to us. So this has enabled us to make the decision. Yes, that we want to continue uh, pursuing the four .0. 
Um, also having a PCI DSS training uh, is important. It's, it's good to make sure that the key stakeholders involved in the PCI DSS implementations are well versed with the PCI standard and what is expected from them. Um, I'll, I'll give another one, if you, if you allow me, I'll give you a third one, which is the, which is the completing yes. the self-assessment questionnaire. I think this is also a good, um, a good strategy forward. Great. Thank you so much for your insights, Dawood. As you mentioned, first one is to refer to the summary of changes, which is available on PCI-SSC website, discussing internally, forming the internal self-assessment, have a detailed discussion with your QSC, uh, understand what are the evolving requirements, mandatory requirements, new requirements, future data requirements as well, will help the organizations to come up and plan for the PCI-DSS 4.0. So, Sam, what do you think are two essential strategies that an organizations can consider? I think for me, the two uh, the two key ones, Sally, the first is, um, it probably sounds a little bit fundamental, but understanding your environment, understanding your services, understanding the asset uh, inventory, and especially the interdependencies, almost going back to basics and really making sure you fully understand what is this environment you're responsible for and securing. And then on top of that, having a good risk culture within the um, within your organization really helps make sure that you've got the right decisions being made, the right support uh, from your uh, your executive and, and stakeholders, but especially in terms of validating uh, the decisions you're making in terms of are these fit for purpose? Are they going to address the risks that you're identifying as part of your targeted risk assessments? And that all falls down on having the fundamentals of good risk culture and good risk understanding. So those two things for me are kind of building blocks in a sense for doing not just PCI, but just good security practice uh, as well. That's a fantastic answer, Sam. So as you mentioned, right, understanding our own organization is one of the most important thing. So once we understand the business processes, the risk principles, risk management uh, technologies or methodologies that we are following in the organization, defining the boundary for PCI-DSS scope, understanding the relevant changes, performing the self-review, having a discussion with your QSA for the detailed gap assessment will ideally help you to achieve PCI-DSS 4.0 in a right track. So Jeremy, over to you, like what are the two strategies that organizations can come up with respect to the seamless transition to 4.0? Well, hopefully you've already done them. And I hopefully that you've been doing a lot of the planning, you've been doing the gap analysis, and, and you've also started talking to your QSAs. You're gonna have a validation, then the earlier you talk with your QSA, especially on some of these new requirements, especially if you're thinking of doing the customized approach, then this is going to really help make that a seamless transition. So we've, we've tried to put out a lot of guidance from the council. We've tried to put out a lot of support because we really want this to be an easy move. But yes, there are some changes. Yes, we've had to react to how criminals are attacking us in this modern world. And so really it is about reading about the basics, as Sam said, getting the basics right, really fundamental starting point is understanding what you have and where, you know, how you use it. And then working with your internal security team and your QSA team together, that's going to give you that seamless transition. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that valuable input, Jeremy. So with my experience to add to all the points that are given by the panel members, so first and foremost thing as we discussed is understanding the organization's aspect. The second one is run the data discovery tool, understand what is the scope, where the card data is underlying, and then ensure that you put a boundary to that and ensure that data is within that particular boundary. Discuss with your QSC, analyze what are the changes that are required, plan for those particular changes, ensure that, you know, uh, the major learnings that we ideally get across, like, you know, example, uh, CISA top five learning from uh, forensic investigations that CISA has done, like various learnings from various ways we can implement in the organization, adding to the point, like having a performing, uh, in, you know, credential-based vulnerability scans, identifying the patching, implementing those patches, getting the application level security uh, done, or coming up with a flexibility that PCI DSS standard has given, like, you know, customized approach, performing the TRA for the required, uh, you know, assets on the respective controls is somewhere we can come up with a seamless transition to PCI DSS 4.0. 
So going ahead with the question and answers, right? So we do have some of the questions in the Q and A you know chat box. So one such question it states, uh, Dawood. The question is like, considering the organizations are critical and huge, like you know complex environments and having the legacy infrastructure, right? So how do you think, or what are the strategies those organizations should follow so that the transition can become easier for them? Yes, um, Chetra. So I'll just try to give an analogy on, on this. So like similar to how Rust can compromise the structural integrity of a ship, we believe outdated legacy systems can, can pose an increased risk to a business. This also includes like security vulnerabilities, compliance issues, and you know, obviously operational failures. That's why organizations should work on removing legacy systems, regardless whether this is a PCR or not PCI requirement. However, I understand that this is not e easy. That is why I recommend the following um, actions. First of all, let's have a firm date plan on when to remove them. If you cannot remove them, at least disable some of the services that you have in place. And what would be even best if you could track the end of life of those legacy systems so that whenever that end of life is approaching, you would take the right action. Now, the beauty of the MPCI DSS is to provide flexibility. And this is what we have seen, right? So this flexibility helps us to reach the intended objective and basically protect the bank's environment. Great. Great answer, Dawood. In fact, what you mentioned, uh, right, maintaining or whenever you get to know the sunset date or UOL date of any of the infrastructure that needs to be maintained. In fact, that is one of the uh, requirements that we see in PCIDSS 4.0 as well. For all the assets in the PCIDSS book, we can even track the UOL date and ensure that there is a plan coming up to remediate those kind of challenges that might come up in future. Thank you so much for your valuable inputs. So there's one more question. The question is something like this, Sam. So considering that various regulatory requirements are in picture, right? Either it can be from a payment domain or from a privacy domain, along with PCI, what do you think are essential strategies that organizations can follow so that the compliance of all this regulatory and PCI is easily maintained? And how do they maintain the PCI DSS 4.0 with respect to regulatory compliance as well? So it's a great question. I think for me, the, the key thing is um, not just understanding, obviously, the PCI controls, but looking at how similar controls uh, across other regulations or compliance standards have a lot in common. And while they might need to be um, represented or evidenced slightly differently, the fundamental core uh, control um, objectives usually are the same. So I think it's, it, it's worth, in order to avoiding audit fatigue and duplication of effort, try to unify um, your compliance model in terms of rationalizing and understanding common controls that can be implemented once and delivered in multiple to meet multiple uh, compliance and regulatory standards. But on top of that, um, treat your compliance uh, programs a bit like projects in terms of they, they are predictable, they have timelines, they are projects in a sense. They shouldn't be something that catches you by surprise. So if you think about it as a, a set of projects that align to one program that is continuous and has common requirements, I think then it's a different way to look at things in terms of unification and continuous compliance as something that uh, isn't just once a year, but it's uh, forever. Uh, and obviously, cross jurisdiction, you know, global organizations are going to need to consider local regulations as well as the standards that their customers and uh, stakeholders expect. So it makes a lot of sense to look at the common control frameworks uh, that apply to you. Great answer, Sam. Uh, in fact, uh, you have highlighted something called unified compliance as well, right? That makes major uh, compliance standards to become on to come to one track very easily. Performing, you know, if you know, if you have an idea about what are the requirements for various other compliances, probably combining them will also give you a better posture, and it is easy to perform the assessments on a proper cycle. And coming up with one particular dashboard to maintain the compliance of various regulatory or privacy or from an infosec will actually help the organizations to plan as it are individual projects. And also unified compliance will actually make the works, you know, make the things much easier, right? 
Great. Thank you. So there is one more question. Uh, Jeremy, this is to you. Like, you know, how do we ideally handle customized approach? Can we implement compensatory control with customized approach? Is that okay? Or it has to be two separate ones? So I think a few things, just a couple of points to clarify on the customized approach. The customized approach is only available to an organization that is having a full validation by a QSA. It's not available if you are undertaking a self-assessment questionnaire. So really we're back to the compensating controls being something that allow an organization to use if there's a legitimate business reason why they couldn't meet the requirement in the first place. So essentially all of the, you know, all the requirements are available for a compensating controls. There are some specific requirements that are not available under the customized approach. So really it's, it's back to this planning and working with your assessor or working through your organization to understand, you know, do we meet the defined approach as it is, or is the technology or the process that we're using means that actually we can't do this? And is that a legitimate business reason we can use a compensating control? Or do we see this as actually just the way this process works and therefore we're going to use a customized approach to use that as a as our way of showing that we meet the intent of the requirement for now and going forward. Again, customer uh, compensating controls are seen as more short term whilst you're adjusting things within your organization. Uh, customized approach is something that forever this new process or this particular way you're doing business means that you aren't going to meet the defined approach and the customized approach allows you to meet that that requirement through the alternative customized way. So really it's working with your internally within your organization to understand the process. It's working with your uh, QSA, if you're using one to, to ensure that you're planned. It's what Sam said, you can't do a customized approach halfway through the, the assessment. You've got to do it from the start. A compensating control could be something that could be addressed mid uh, mid assessment if something strange pops up. So yeah, you can use them both, but understand how they work and which is going to be the right one for you. Great answer, Jeremy. Thank you so much for highlighting those. You know, compensatory control and the customized approach, and our organizations can use both of them in order to meet the intent of the requirement. So there is one more question here. It says that how frequently we can perform the API pen test. So answering this particular question from an application level pen test, it's an annual activity. However, if there is any changes in the security level or if you're making any changes from an application level, as and when that particular changes happens, we have to perform the penetration test. It can be either from the application level or even from the infrastructure aspect as well. So I hope I've answered your question. So considering that, uh, there are a few more questions that we can see in the Q&A section. We will be reaching out to you over email individually and we will be answering all the questions. Considering that, uh, we have reached the end of this particular webinar. So as we conclude today's webinar on winning strategies for PCIDSS 4.0, I want to express my sincere gratitude for all the you know insightful sessions to all the panel members, Sam, Jeremy, and Dawood. You have been very great and your valuable inputs will ensure the various organizations implementing the PCRDSS 4.0 to have a seamless transition. Thank you so much once again to all the participants who have given your valuable time to join the session and making this particular session a grateful one. Thank you and stay vigilant. Have a nice time.